morning. Hey. Okay. All right. So my name is Ms. Nina Salkin. I'm going to be talking a little bit about data transparency today, how we can make a lot of the back end in our applications more visible to the end user. So just a little bit of background about me. Um, it's lovely to be back in my college town of Ann Arbor. I got like, two undergraduate de degrees here and graduated my master's from the School of Information just last April. I'm currently a lead product designer over at Ford Motor Company in Dearborn. My department is the Mobility Analytics Products and Services Department. We collaborate with data scientists on a series of different applications, some of the UI, some that are purely back-end uh, products. Please feel free to follow me on Twitter or email me with any questions. I'll put my contact information back up on the board when I'm done with my presentation. Um, so welcome to World IA Day. First off, let's start with some definitions. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I see an algorithm and how that connects to the UX space. This is a very basic definition over here that an algorithm is a logical progression that makes optimized decision given parameters within defined constraints. Sounds very boring, so let's break it down a little bit. So the first piece is that it's logical. So that means that this is a step-by-step -step process. Code can be very elegant in how it's written, but it also has to follow certain rules. If this, then that. While this happens, do that, you know? And so when you talk to data scientists who are writing these algorithms and have them explain to you that logical progression, suddenly you have a workflow and a system that you can understand the same way that we map, we map workflows and systems out in the real world. So that logical piece is absolutely essential in order to communicate about what an algorithm is with your colleagues. The next piece is that algorithms are optimized. So that means that they have a particular goal in mind. And when you're aiming for one particular goal, that often means that there are trade-offs. Um, if you are optimizing based on someone's personal tastes, like a recommendation algorithm, where are you getting that data from? What are you prioritizing there? And understanding how that algorithm is optimized can tell you what sort of things you're trying to prioritize in that space. The next piece is that there are parameters involved. So the parameters are the variables at play that make that optimization possible. So if you're trying to achieve a goal, it's sort of the how behind that and how you weight parameters determines whether or not you're actually optimizing for the best possible outcome. So as you can tell here, there's a bit of a like, um, you have a workflow that is based on certain um, goals that are defined by variables and operate within a scope. That's the constraints part. The fact that you're operating within a specific space and understanding the environment in which an algorithm is at play can really help you understand um, what it means to your end user. So that is a very brief overview about what an algorithm is and can be. Um, I'm gonna talk about a few examples so that you guys have a better understanding of how it applies in the real world, the companies we all know. So Uber, for example, has a routing algorithm that helps you get from place to place. Um, in order to give you an accurate estimated time of arrival to the drivers, they have to take into uh, account traffic conditions and the weather and a couple of other factors. Those are the parameters here. They're optimizing to get you somewhere as quickly as possible, right? And um, the constraint is within whatever geographic area you have specified. So that is the Uber algorithm. Amazon and Netflix, have a recommendation algorithms like I briefly mentioned before. If you liked this purchase, perhaps you would like this purchase. Because you looked at that item, maybe you would like that item. Netflix, when they first rolled out the recommendation algorithm, actually included labels that make it very, very clear what they were trying to do. Because you watched such and such, maybe you would like this like list of other options. So they were actually calling out the fact that they were using your previous like uh, watch history to determine what sort of things they would recommend you watch in the future. And that builds a lot of trust from the outset. You know why those things are being recommended to you and eventually Netflix stopped that labeling as people grew to trust the platform. Kayak is also up here because they're a little bit different in that they use a predictive modeling 
um, algorithm to determine airfares. So they're trying to give you the best possible price by estimating when prices are going to go up or down. And they actually train on historical data to do that. Um, so algorithms are really everywhere in all of the applications that we use on a daily basis. But a lot of times we don't really think about them. We look at Kayak and we're annoyed by the spacing or by like the way they order materials or how their filters work and that's great. But we also need to peel back that front end layer and look at what's hidden underneath because that also has an impact on the overall user experience. And so like, where is the UX, you know? So like, it sounds all good, but where exactly can we find that piece? Um, and the first uh, piece of it would be operations. So does the algorithmic logic match real world scenarios? And I touched on this very slightly before, but the idea is like if an algorithm is a step-by-step -step workflow of sorts, that means that we can actually map it to a real world workflow through field of research and stuff like that. So um, an example I can give you here is Spotify. So Spotify has this wonderful feature called Discover Weekly. It comes in every Monday morning, right? And then it gives you a recommendation of things that you might want to listen to. And they do this based on like really advanced analytics and textual analysis. They're looking at the rhythms of what you listen to and trying to match it to other songs or albums or artists. And that's phenomenal because that means users are getting recommendations for music they would actually like. But the downside of that is that you're never exposed to new music that you never thought to listen to. You're stuck within this little bubble. You are not pushed out of your comfort zone. So at the end of the day, what Spotify needs to do is go out to their users and determine, okay, what are our users' goals? Does everyone go to Discover Weekly to find more music that they know they'll like? Or do they go to Discover Weekly to explore new genres and explore new areas? Are people looking to get out of their comfort zone or not? And so how you optimize that wonderful recommendation feature is highly dependent on the goals that your users may have. And the only way you can get that information is by going out and talking to users and employing the UX methods that we're all familiar with. The second piece is like the human element. So a lot of people think about algorithms and data and it seems like a cold hard science, but there is this huge human element there. And there are emotional implications <coughs> attached to any sort of decision making, logical or not. So a very popular um, story that came out a few years ago was about Target uh, sending out personalized ads to a 16 or 17 year old woman who had not yet told her parents that she was pregnant. And so all of the ads were for like diapers and prenatal vitamins and it created this whole little snafu in her life and opened an investigation by the New York Times about what, how is our personal data being used to target um, the customers. And the thing is, the reason Target even did this in the first place is because Target is not the everything store or at least like that brand that they're trying to portray wasn't very successful. People came for one thing, they came for the cleaning supplies or they came for the furniture. It was never really the one-stop shop for all of their various departments. So they're like, let's go to people who are at vulnerable stages in their lives where their routine has broken down and use that opportunity to create, to form a habit, right? Let's bring them here and show them that like, yes, this can be your one spot and we can establish a new routine for them. Um, and, so that's, and so they specifically made a targeted campaign to potentially new mothers. And that's how all this came about. So it was very much a business decision, but they forgot about the emotional implications of actually aggressively um, targeting people who are at those vulnerable stages in their life. No one wants to be taken advantage of in that way, and it was a huge PR problem for them once that information got out. So if there's people there who can act as the voice of the user and remind people about the downstream impact of these decisions, then a lot of that could have been avoided. The next piece is ethics. So I feel like right now, ethics, like the whole like um, making a difference piece is really, really ingrained in UX culture right now, um, at least for the last year, if not the last two years. You know, I think last year, Wyatt's theme was designed for good. 
um, I, uh, World Usability Day had a similar sort of um, theme this year. So a lot of people are talking about ethics, and the first thing people usually think about is data privacy. But that's not the long and short of it. It's also about what you're optimizing for. So people are talking about how Facebook mine user data. Okay, yes, that's a huge encroachment on privacy. But the reason they did that is because they created a business model that was based off not interpersonal communication and developing relationships, but on engagement with content because they chose a like, um, like sort of a sponsorship focused business model. If people engage with content from sponsors, they get the ad revenue, that's their business model. In this case, that means their newsfeed was optimized to get you to click on things that were put by sponsors, not by your friends, not by your um, colleagues, not by <coughs> anything else that actually exists in terms of personal relationships. And this was that decision to optimize the newsfeed in that way that prompted the decision to also take advantage of personal data. So when you come in at the beginning and you think about your business model and how you want your algorithm to be developed and what it's optimizing for, it's really essential to think about what's again the downstream implications of that. Um, you should, if Facebook is meant to be a place that is to build community, then the algorithm should reflect that, not just the branding. Another piece that I'm actually going to pull from my own work afterward is equality. So algorithms, depending on what sort of training data you're using, if it's a machine learning algorithm or other sort of um, biases, can definitely come into play. When you're optimizing for a specific thing, there are trade-offs. And it's important to recognize those trade-offs and determine if it's ever causing any sort of inequity. So I work on a project called Go Ride Health. Um, it's a pretty cool project. It, we provide non-emergency medical transportation for anyone who needs it. So our API directs drivers to pick up and drop off points so that patients get, can get to the medical appointments on time, um, even if they're in a low income area and don't have any other form of mobility. So it's a really amazing service, but we have to be as efficient as possible to help serve the most amount of people that we can in a given time period. And that means we look at things such as like the boarding time. How long does it take for one person to get onto our transit van before they're able to actually take them to the hospital or to a dialysis facility or what have you? And the thing is, um, if you are in a wheelchair, it takes on average 20 to 25 minutes to board. If you are walking, it takes less than five. So what ends up happening is that when we're choosing which rides we're going to serve, there's an inherent bias against people with longer boarding times, in this case, people who are confined to wheelchairs. So by integrating this um, idea of uh, boarding times to create a more efficient algorithm and like serve more people, which sounds like a good thing, right? We're actually creating the sense of inequity between two different user groups and that can have huge consequences, especially when you're working in the healthcare industry. And it really took, really me essentially, because no one else got this, because everyone is acting in a different mindset, to say like, hey, we need a counteracting force against this bias in our algorithm. We can look at loading time, that's fine, but we need to somehow have some sort of counteracting keys to make sure that there is equity between the two. And now one of our benchmarks is actually to look at the proportion of wheelchair and walking um, patients and make sure that the amount in the original raw data set is still the same proportion that we serve. So that's an example of how you can be biased against certain user groups and how you can use benchmarking and collaboration with your team members to ensure that that's no longer the case. The last piece that I'm gonna talk about is transparency. So like all these cases so far, that these examples I've been giving you have been largely on the back end. But the thing is, if you do have a front end, use it to make that algorithm more transparent. If you have a series of logical steps, outline them for your users in the UI. Give them a little bit of a sneak peek into like how and why you're doing what you're doing. That example with Netflix and the labels is one um, way that you can do that. Because you watch this, suddenly it becomes very clear to your users that the reason you're getting these recommendations 
is because you watch those things. Netflix also used labels such as because you rated this five stars. Well, that means, oh, you mean if I rate things, I'm going to get better recommendations? Let me do that. It's sort of a suggestion just in terms of like something as simple as a label to tell you how something is operating on the back end. And that's why there's so much trust in that platform and the recommendations that they provide. More so, I think, than anyone trusts Facebook or Twitter, where those strings are a little bit more invisible. So like I said before, it's really all about trust. If you can somehow establish trust with your users by identifying um, inequities early, by talking to users to make sure that you're optimizing for their goals as opposed to purely business goals, if you are making it more transparent to your users how these algorithms are being implemented and how it's going to affect their experience, you suddenly have a platform that can garner that level of trust. And that's probably the core of any sort of UX-focused project when it comes to back-end products, and specifically the world of a uh, data-driven algorithm. So what can we do with all this information? I hope I've made the case that like UX is pretty relevant in this field, but there's a variety of research methods that are unique to the UX discipline that we can really put into play here. Contextual inquiry, the idea of like observing people in their natural environment, ethnography. So in my case, I actually go to patients' homes and talk to their caregivers and talk to them about their experiences, like getting into their personal lives and understanding all of the factors at play so that you can map out edge cases that some, uh, like a single workflow such as an algorithm may not provide for. Um, field research, actually seeing the operation in effect. Journey mapping so that you can trace the user's journey and their touch points on things other than just your algorithm. What other factors are at play that influences how they see the work that you are doing? Um, card sorting, less relevant here, I don't know why it's there. <laughs> I pulled this from another slide, that's why. Usability testing though, um, in a lot of cases you can usability test even when you don't have a front end. What you're doing is you're usability testing the system. You're essentially um, asking people to look at a workflow and identify the problems there. And you can even engage in participatory design and have them be like, no, I don't do this first, I do that first. And it helps you map that real world scenario so that you can go back to your data scientist later and have that discussion about where things match or where things don't. The other piece is like research delivery. So at the end of the day, um, when I first started on this project, my manager was like, okay, so like, you're doing all this research, what value does it add? Like I need to see something concrete, there's nothing tangible, right? You're not making a comp. And for people who don't always understand our discipline, sometimes they forget that there are so many assets that we can provide that demonstrate that research. Whether that's an affinity diagram, whether it's something as simple as a point of view statement that you put up on the board and you encourage everyone to iterate on. Um, how might these statements, and all of those things that like help you do research synthesis can actually act as a living research asset that you continue to update as you conduct more research and learn more about the context and the situation. Um, personas, of course, can be very uh, helpful in this space. Storyboards, experience maps. When it comes to um, algorithms, I find out of all of these, an experience map can be the most helpful because it outlines, like I said, that real world scenario. It shows you how things are actually working at play in the field. And then it really opens the eyes of people who are stuck within the algorithmic logic and think that just because I coded it this way, this is how the world really is and helps you find those places of overlap or mismatch. So there's a few myths that are associated with UX in that space, and as I've mentioned before, the relevancy is key here. If we're gonna actually make progress in being the voice of the user for back-end products and services, we have to be able to push for the fact that it's relevant and that it's important and it does have value. Um, so we have to destroy that myth, especially in large organizations where maybe that's not quite as accepted yet. And the second piece is ownership. Depending on the organizational structure of your company, you may find that people who own the front end 
want to own the entire research process. The difference is, though, usability testing for front end and conducting generative research about the API that front end calls is going to reveal very, very different results in terms of research because you're going in with two different goals. Someone with a front end is saying, like, hey, is this easy to use? And someone who's calling the back end is like, hey, is this equitable? Is this transparent? It's, a, it's, it's just, um, there's a lot of opportunity for collaboration between the two spaces, but having someone who focuses on those backend features can really make a strong impact there. Um, there are a couple of obstacles too in terms of getting into this space. The first one is the skill set. So I don't believe that the traditional academic path really facilitates um, a world where like you, we can specialize in this space as much simply because it's not very popularized at the moment. There's going to be like, people have to invest the time and effort to gather the technical acumen to really collaborate with data scientists. I know UMSI is fantastic about that because they force you to take classes <coughs> in Python, which feels like a waste of time. It's not. <laughs> so if there's any grad students here, trust me, 506 and 507 are worth it. Um, <laughs> but like the idea is that not every UX sure fits in that space, and that's okay. But you can go out there and learn more and self-teach um, and self-learn and gather the skill set necessary to conquer this. Um, but we need to have the initiative to do that if we're interested in this space. The next piece is like deliverables. So like I said before, a lot of people don't see the value in pure user research if you don't have anything to show for it. Um, people expect a comp because it's called like, at least in my organization, product design. And then like when we like think about full stack product designers and we forget that user research component, all of a sudden it feels like you're doing half your job. And so I really encourage people to really like focus on the deliverable aspect. How can you communicate what you've learned? If it stays in your head and you're just arguing for it based on whatever you've retained, it doesn't really have an impact on your team and it's very hard to actually champion change. So if you're writing that down and synthesizing that research in a way that makes sense to your colleagues who may be developers, PMs, data scientists, your manager, what have you, all of a sudden you have something tangible that they can look at and recognize as valuable and important. So like at the end of the day, it's really in our hands to take the responsibility and do our due diligence for not just the front end of applications, but the back end of applications as well. And we all have the power to do that. So I really encourage you guys to think more about not just the front end, but the back end as well, and how you can make a really strong impact there. Any questions? Not a single question? Okay, there we go. How did you um, get into the space? Get into the space. Um, I was, uh, I started off at Ford my first year in grad school. So I have been full-time grad school, full-time Ford for the last two years. Um, it's when I first joined Ford, it, UX was mainly a shared service. Like it was like um, a sort of a consultancy within the organization. And then we had this massive transformation where we created product teams and designers were suddenly embedded into one product, which was awesome because you can kind of see it end to end and really have a stronger impact there. When that change happened, I requested a move to Ford Labs. So I was part of one of the first teams at Ford Labs, which I believe is a sponsor here is awesome um, and when we graduated and like that particular team had a strong data science component so I was able to collaborate with data scientists from the very beginning of my career and really understand how I can communicate with them um, over time it was just really practice um, I've been on let's see four different products since starting at Ford um, and each one of them touched data science in some way. And the more I was open to listening to my data scientist colleagues and working with them and facilitating ideation workshops with those people in the room, the more I was able to gain this sort of knowledge. 
Um, I'm also very lucky in that, like I said before, I went to UNSI, and as my interest in data science grew, because I was just naturally in that space through my career, I went out of my way to take classes like personalized informatics with um, Eric or um, information visualization, Charles Severance, like, you know, um, I don't know if they still offer those classes, I'm sure they do, but 506, 507, like those, by picking and choosing my courses, in accordance with the career I was following, it helped me really hone in on that space. Thank you for sharing and thanks for your specific example about the wheelchair users um, or the app that you're working on. I'm really interested in how you were able to make a case considering that um, a, a short span of time would seem to, from an economic perspective, be um, a great advantage. Um, how were you able to make the case that a longer span of time for a wheelchair user was worth uh, towards um, changing the algorithm for you? Um, mainly because the business team and the algorithm team are separate, right? So there's someone who handles the business model and contracts with like all the different agencies we work with to make all of this happen. My product team is entirely focused on the technology. So when you are removed from the business side and you're focusing entirely on the technology, efficiency is key. Because we're like, oh, the business told us vehicle utilization, that's what we're doing. But if you actually go to the people who are part of that business, they didn't get into the business to make money. Like non-emergency medical transportation is a huge market, yes, but like there is like an inherent like goodness to it in that like they honestly wanted to provide this service. So if you appeal to them, people who aren't caught up in the details of the technology and to the people who were invested in this idea to begin with as something that should be an equitable service, it was easy to get buy-in from their side and then push that towards my team. Um, I think that I'm just also very lucky in that I have a team where like, at the end of the day, those minutes are negligible, right? Like we really should be as equal as possible. Like, and that trumps any sort of business value. If your business model is based upon an equity, it's not going to last long. Um, that's my personal view. And I think I just have a good team and I believe in the inherent goodness of people. I think when you reveal these sort of inequities, people are like, oh my God, like they don't realize it at first. It's like, it's not, some sort of like corrupt, like I want to get this. It's more of a, oh my God, I didn't even realize that. And as soon as they realize it, they're like, oh my God, we have to change it, you know? So it's about finding it more so than it is um, about like actively trying to make money over the, the equity, you know? Any other questions? So we don't have data scientists at the company where I work. We have um, like back end and front end devs. I'm kind of sure. wondering like what, where's the overlap there? Okay. It's, uh, yeah, so uh, personally I work with full stack developers as well as data scientists. When you're working with back end developers and front end developers, I would argue that they also have two different mindsets and different priorities. Um, I would actually recommend that, like, I don't know if you do front-end pairing, like, do you ever talk to your front-end devs and, like, go through the UI together? I would do the same thing <coughs> with your back-end engineers and learn a little bit about how they approach solutions and their logic. And once you have an understanding of their mindset and their approach, you can start um, identifying maybe problems in that approach or, like, areas for improvement and kind of investigate based off of that. But like communication is key there. It's about understanding their approach and then kind of verifying the assumptions that they're making, right? At the end of the day, everyone goes into their job with certain assumptions in mind. And as you actually you try to leave those assumptions at the door. Um, but another thing is like to be that sort of like check and balance on your team and to verify the assumptions inherent in any sort of development or technology process. That I think is the key there. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank okay, you. Okay, cool. Yep. Um, sort of a two-part question. Um, uh, I was wondering if you have any ideas about how uh, data scientists can advocate for this on their side. 
Um, and also, uh, you were lucky in this accessibility for the um, presentation project to be working on a project that it sounds like, if I understand correctly, uh, is a nice thing for to do it, right? Um, how do you advocate for these uh, equality practices when it is a income-based model, right? Um, mm -hmm. Um, okay, so the first part was about data scientists and what exactly, I'm sorry. How, how do we advocate our How do we advocate for them? Okay, um, so in my case, it's about working with them. So I may have already done like some user research and have some ideas in my mind. But what I do is I go in and I ask them questions. And I ask targeted questions that help them recognize what I found. I'm like, well, what if this scenario happened? Or what if this happened? You know, I found this, what do you think about that? And encouraging them to speak to you instead of you going there and instructing them based on what you've learned gets their buy-in from the start. And I think that over time, just by leading by example, you get a certain respect within your team. And especially from data scientists who often maybe feel like they like, um, because they're in that operational mindset, don't think of those things. They actually like appreciate the fact that you're there to find those things for them. Because at the end of the year, you're, you're one team, you have one goal, and you're helping them in their own jobs. You're giving them one less thing to think about, right? And you're able to collaborate with them going forward. And over time, it sort of rubs off. The same way it does on any team that you join that's never worked with a designer before, with a UX person, I realize that if you do your job well, you can easily gain respect and people start trusting your opinion more and more. It's really hard for the first like three to six months. And then usually you have like this breakthrough moment where everyone's like, you know what? Like, I can't believe she thought of that. Like, I never would have thought of that. And I'd be like, I didn't think of it. The users thought of it, but sure, I'll take credit, you know? So it's kind of like that sort of relationship where as long as you're doing your due diligence, I think it comes through. Um, in terms of an income-based <coughs> model, even when we have an income-based model, PR and branding is hugely important. So when necessary, you can be like, hey, what do you think about, like, a journalist getting their hands on this information you know what would happen then do you realize what the consequences are of going down this path and you can kind of push it from like more of a marketing perspective a PR perspective like we're gonna lose customers in the long run because we didn't provide a hot like a high quality of service um, because at the end of the day, your product competes on quality in the same way it competes on price or anything else. And this data transparency piece is part of that quality. That's how I would go about it. Uh, should I take one more? Or? No, we're, no, we're, we're done? Okay. Time. <laughs> no more questions. We have a break coming up in a second. Yep. Uh, 20 minutes. So. Thank you. Just want to remind everyone that we do have the Empathy Lab going on next door concurrently, so if that's something that interests you, that'll be going until 11.30. Um, but up next, I want to introduce Mike Oswald.